Freddie Overstegen was only 14 years old when she joined the Dutch resistance during World War II and only a couple years older when she became one of his armed assassins. Together with her sister and later a young woman named Hanny Schaft, the trio lured, ambushed, and killed German Nazis and their Dutch collaborators. That was the opening paragraph of a History.com article about the life of Freddie Overstegen. And my God, does it sound like something Quentin Tarantino is chomping at the bits to make into his final feature film. In fact, I would argue that any World War II buff would want to see her story adapted for the big screen, especially in the modern age of pushing female-led action franchises. Sure, her story isn't a franchise, so to speak, but it's something of merit and something of value. And I'm not going to lie, pure entertainment. Freddie Nanda Overstegen was born on September 6th, 1925 in the Netherlands, more specifically Schoden, a village in the province of North Holland, now known as Harlem. Her parents were Jacob Overstegen and Trinity van der Molen, and they were members of an international red aid, a social service group organized by the Communist International. So her parents were commies. She was definitely a communist by belief, and she carried out her beliefs in many different ways, such as taking in Jews from Amsterdam and Germany to help protect them from the Nazis. Now, not much is known about Freddie's childhood, with the exception that Freddie and her older sister, Truce, joined the Dutch Youth Federation, which is a communist affiliate, and what they did is they made dolls for children that were caught up in the Spanish Civil War. Though... There is a little interesting tale that she said once in a Vice interview back in 2016 where she documented the divorce between her mother and her father. At this point in time, the family was living in a large shipping barge in the city and they were poor, dirt poor, had no money. Her father didn't have a job and he never actually brought in any money. And her mother eventually just got fed up and had enough and was like, I'm done, I'm out of here, I wanna go. And the dad didn't really put up a fight from my understanding. In fact, what Freddie said here was that her dad's divorce really was him just kind of bidding them farewell with a French song that he sang from the bow of the ship as the mother packed up the two kids, all of their stuff and left. Suffice it to say, she didn't really see him a lot after that, nor was he a large part of her life by any metric. However, when the war did come to the Netherlands, Freddie saw the horrors of it firsthand, and she and her older sister wanted to do something about it. But there was definitely a worry that the family's communist beliefs would be discovered and they would be, in fact, executed. However, this didn't stop Freddie or Truce from handing out anti-Nazi leaflets while they worked as nurses on the German border in Eastern Holland. This is actually when they caught the attention of Harlem Council of Resistance Commander Franz van der Veel, who came to their door and asked their mother if the 14-year-old and her 16-year-old older sister could join the resistance. And their mom flat out gave permission. That's pretty crazy. The mom's like, oh yeah, you want our kids to go kill Nazis? By all means, have at it, us. That's my take on it, at least. But from there, the girls did receive some military training, you know, like how to march into the woods and how to shoot. And specifically, they were instructed on how to shoot Nazis. In fact, that was one of the selling points. Like, we're going to teach you to shoot and you're going to learn how to kill Nazis. So again, Quentin Tarantino, why aren't you making this story? What they didn't know at the time was that they were going to be joining a seven-member underground cell that was based in the city of Harlem. And it was there that they learned that their job would be to use dynamite to blow up bridges, as well as railway tracks, to cut off transportation supply routes and things like that. And of course, you know, the murdering of Nazis. That was a big one. This is actually where they met Hanny Shaft the following year when she joined the team, bringing it to an eight-member unit. Hanny was another freedom fighter who became a very popular beacon during this time, predominantly for her fiery red hair. She was actually responsible for sabotaging and assassinating various targets. She carried out many attacks on Germans, Dutch Nazis, collaborators, and traitors. I mean, she went as far as to learn how to speak German fluently 
in order to become involved with German soldiers. How she got the designation of the girl with the red hair was actually because she was seen at a location of a particular assassination, and her involvement in that led to the identifier on one of the Nazis' most wanted lists as just the girl with the red hair. There's a reason why The Girl with the Red Hair was a 1981 Dutch film that was about Hanny Schaaf's life. Sadly, from the Wikipedia, it does appear that they left out Freddy and Truis, which is really sad because I feel they were an integral part of the team. However, Shaft did not, and this also accounts for Freddy and Truis as well, that they did not accept every assignment. There was one time when they were asked to kidnap the children of a Nazi official but they ultimately refused because if the plan had failed, the children would have had to have been killed. And Shaft felt that this was too similar to what the Nazis did to instill terror on people. However, this was war and not everything goes according to plan because on June 21st, 1944, Hanny Shaft and Jan Bonekamp were assigned to carry out an assassination on a Dutch police officer and collaborator named Willem Ragut. Bonecamp was actually shot in the stomach before being able to kill Ragut. As a result of being mortally wounded, Bonecamp fled the scene but was later arrested and taken to the hospital. There, he inadvertently gave up Hanny Schaff's name and address to Dutch Nazi nurses who were faking being resistance workers. This actually prompted the Nazis to launch a retaliatory mission in order to force Shaft to confess. The German authorities actually went and arrested her parents and sent them to a concentration camp in order to kind of draw her out. The distress over that situation and the grief over her friend dying forced Henny Shaft to actually cease any and all resistance work for the time, and eventually her parents were released. This happened about two months later. However, when things kind of got back to normal, Henny Shaft wanted to resume her resistance work, but she wanted to be a little bit smarter about it, so she decided to dye her hair black and wear glasses to hide her identity. And once she got into this again, she was contributing with assassinations and a lot of sabotage, as well as doing courier work and the transportation of illegal weapons and the dissemination of illegal newspapers. And that is what ultimately got her arrested at a checkpoint in Harlem back on March 21st, 1945, where she was busted under the guise of distributing uh, an illegal communist newspaper, but that was simply just a cover story. She was actually transporting secret documentation for the resistance. It was here where she was brought to a prison in Amsterdam, and after a lot of interrogation and torture and solitary confinement, she was ultimately identified by the roots of her red hair. This is when the Nazis decided that they were going to execute her. Sadly, Shaft was executed on April 17th, 1945, when two Dutch Nazi officials took her out to the middle of nowhere and one shot her at close range, only wounding her. This is where we get a little bit of fairy tale, of folklore. But if this is cool, if she actually taunted her executioners with her last breath, that's pretty badass to be fair. She apparently says, I shoot better, after which the other man delivered the final shot. But before Hanny Schaff's death, the three girls primarily worked together as a standalone unit. For a couple years, actually, they were tasked with the murdering of Nazi officers and their Dutch collaborators because no one would likely see them coming. Freddy would actually go on to eventually describe this as a necessary evil. Some of their assignments actually involved them acting as bait. One time, while Freddy stood as a lookout, Truis entered a restaurant and struck up a conversation with a high-ranking SS officer. While flirting with him, she asked him to go on a walk in the woods, and once they were out on their stroll and isolated, they would run into another man along the same path. Unknown to the Nazi officer, this guy was actually part of the resistance, who would then shoo the young girl away before he unceremoniously killed the Nazi officer and dumped his body in a nearby grave, which had already been dug. Now, what was really fascinating about that particular story is in that 2016 Vice interview, Freddie commented on her sister's looks, basically referred to her as being a plain Jane. 
I think this was in part because Freddie was always referred to as the cute one, the cute little girl in pigtails, things like that. Whereas her older sister wasn't, was more homely, but was very confident, very straightforward, and was able to, I think, get what she wanted. So she used that as the way to lure out the Nazi officer for a straw. But at the end of the day, I think really what it boiled down to was if you apply enough pressure, any man is going to think with his dick, even if it ends up killing him, which in this case it did. But eventually the girls soon graduated to eliminating their own targets, which Freddie would later describe as liquidations. I love that the older she got, the more cold and calculated she became when describing the events from the war. She had already listed them as a necessary evil. And here she is just giving you the cold, hard reality of what needed to be done to save lives. And that is really interesting to me. But one of the tactics they would do is a, a drive-by shooting, believe it or not. And this was really interesting. Truist would be pedaling the bike. And on the back, Freddie would be holding the pistol and she would start firing. This is how that they were able to roll up on Nazi officers, gun them down, and then just pedal off. And because they were two young looking girls on a bicycle, no one thought to look at them twice. Not only that, but they would follow officers home and ambush them when their guard was down. And while they did ultimately consider this work to be necessary at the time, they did have trouble grappling with it. I think later on in life, Freddie has come to fully understand that, which is why she describes it the way that she does. But she also has said that it was very difficult in those times when they would shoot a man, they would feel the strange compulsion to help him get up. That it was such a, they hadn't made that disassociation yet. And to me, that's quite fascinating. But it's also a child who was now an assassin for an underground resistance movement fighting back against Axis powers. It is immeasurable the amount of stress that these kids were under and that they pulled this off the way that they did is literally just insane. Like I said, one of the best ways they were able to avoid detection was simply because of how they looked and how young they dressed. Nazi soldiers wouldn't pay them any attention. And in many instances, that was a very fatal mistake. Three weeks after Hanny Schaaf's execution, the Netherlands were liberated and the war was effectively over. One of the things that Freddie has said in response to that is questioning why the Nazis had to execute her then. Why couldn't they just have waited? It's war. And to quote Fallout, war never changes. They wanted to send a message, and that's probably why they did it. But from here, the girls had to move on with their life. And how were they going to do it? For Freddie, the war never even ended. Really, according to her son, leading up to the days of her own death, she never really walked away from the war. It was always on her mind. She died not far from where her and her sister and friends had committed these assassinations during the war. Truist went on to become a sculptor and marry another member of the resistance and ultimately become the face of what they accomplished during the war. And ultimately, her and her sister became board members on the National Hanny Shaft Foundation, which was established by Truist. And this actually came at a bit of an odd fight, too, because post-World War II, during the McCarthyism era, there was a massive pushback against communism. And considering the fact that Freddie and her sister were both avid communists and the way that the Dutch government was trying to push the commemoration of Hanny Schaaf's life and accomplishes and her, her death, uh, she felt that there was this ever-growing rift between her and her home country, which she loved and fought for. Eventually, all of that went away and Hanny Schaaf did get the commemoration that her friends were seeking for her, which is a really good thing. And sadly, just a few days before her 93rd birthday, Freddie Overstegen passed away. Her legacy is one that is somewhat relegated to a few articles here and there with some information, not all information being available, but it's such a compelling story. 
a 14 year old girl thrust into a resistance movement during World War II, wanting to help, wanting to fight against injustice, going as far as to lure SS officers to the woods to assassinate them, to perform drive by assassinations while pedaling on a bike, ambushing them in their homes, but not wanting to target their children, having some humanity and some empathy. It goes to show you that war is as bad as it seems, and it's not always just on whichever front the war is fighting. It is all over. Freddie Overstegen's story is so fascinating to me and one that I would love to read up more on. And as always, this has been another episode of Stranger Days. If you enjoyed this story, please let me know in the comments section. If you have another tale you'd like me to cover, please let me know. I'll talk to you all later. Have yourself a great day. Thank you again for listening and peace out.